Again, I'd point out that the details of the Inuit people's settlement proposal are contained in the Nisika paper, which is on the floor and is available to everyone here. <coughs> uh, some further announcements have been brought to my attention. We have a few other Native leaders here in the uh, room with us. So we have the President and the Vice President of Nova, Nova Scotia Non-Status and Métis Association, Ms. Viola Robinson and Lorraine Cox. We have the... Uh, the Secretary Treasurer of, this, of the Native Council of Canada, Mr. Fred Jobin, and the Vice President of the Manitoba Métis Federation, Ms. Mary Gibault. Our next speaker is Harry Daniels, the Land Claims Director for the Métis Association of Alberta. Harry. Where do you start and where do you end? I was just talking with Bill Wilson and I said I'm sick and tired of speaking at conventions and meetings and uh, conferences. This is my second UN conference and engaging in the verbal diarrhea that Bill has uh, expressed. I share his cynicism. The only thing that Canadian society has afforded me so far as an educated person under their system is at the age of 35 to be an old man with ulcers and bad nerves. To learn about a system that doesn't give a damn about its own people, much less about the native people of Canada. We, the Métis and non-status Indians of Canada, number approximately a million people. We outnumber both the Treaty Indians and the Inuit put together. It is not because we are not Indians, or not because we don't have an Indian heritage. It is because of the policies of the Canadian government that have divided us. We cannot effectively deal with our land rights when the Treaty Indians have to go to the Minister of Indian Affairs and Northern Development and we have to go to, Judge, uh, we have to, go to Hugh Faulkner or uh, Ron Basford, a son of a Basford, and uh, various other people. There are so many laws that exist that for us to effectively deal with them would take us a hundred years of getting educated in the system and by that time they're going to change it on us. Personally, I've spent ten years studying Aboriginal rights. And I was sitting in Edmonton just last week. And the realization came to me what a stupid man I am. There's nothing to study. The existence of our Aboriginal rights and land claims is a reality. So why study it? Why am I a land claim director of research? Because we're sucked into that system that makes us fight their way, that makes us compile data, categorize it, and put it in little cubicles and little pigeonholes and little index cards and on microfilm and filing folders and I was sitting there and I said, Jesus Christ, Harry, you've wasted 10 years of your goddamn life. The Métis people have fought two wars of liberation against the Canadian government in 1869 and 70 and again in 1885. They call them rebellions here. I choose to call them wars of resistance. We fought to save a free Indian nation in the West as we knew it at that time because of what had happened in the East. 
Our leaders at that time, Louis Riel, Ambrose Le Pen, and before them, Cuthbert Grant, realized that the encroaching hordes from Europe were going to commit cultural and physical genocide against the people who were so close to God that they wanted to share this land with a bunch of pricks. If I'm swearing here and if I get out of hand, I'm, I'm not going to apologize for it. I said how I, how I feel. Yesterday I was asked, are you going to get involved in demonstrations or in violence? Well, that's ridiculous. How can we wage a war against a government that would wipe us out in a couple of hours? And it's a red herring, as I stated yesterday. The violence that we have to talk about is the violence of the Canadian government, the violence of the governments in South America, in Africa, in India, and in Australia, New Zealand, and anywhere where indigenous peoples exist. Oppression is running rampant, and the dominant society is waging a war on humanity. That is the violence you talk about. Not the violence that they would like to see us do, blowing up bridges, burning down buildings, gas lines or whatever. The lack of a land base and the need to identify with a certain piece of geography is inherent in every human being, not only we Indian people. You talk to anybody, they can trace their families back to the Rhine Valley or to Glasgow, Scotland, or the Highlands, or some Manchester, England, or wherever in Europe. We can do the same things. Yet we can't live in our valleys anymore. The Salish people cannot live on this piece of land anymore. Why? Because there's a bloody Air Force base here that no one wants anymore.